I met all these really cool cops that were telling me all about when they went to Woodstock and everything. <laughs> it was great. I guess there was a guy there that wasn't really into us, but he wrote a really nice review and we did uh, the show in New York and that was kind of a surprise and it was really nice. And I think when people get to know a bit more about us, they might find a few more things they like. They'll probably find yeah. a lot more things they dislike, but... You know, basically the music's like second fiddle to their other desires. Our music comes first. Other things have happened involved with Stephen that Stephen is basically someone I used to know. It makes me feel bad, yeah. but... I either stand there bored or I run back and forth and and I kind of get into dancing. I don't even know that I like what I do. I just, I look down at my feet and go, what am I doing now? Because it might not have happened to you, but it might have happened to the two or three people that are standing around you who got some fucked up family life that's going to come back to haunt them when they hit about the age of 25. And then you got to find your way trying to climb your way out of what you thought was your life, but it looks more in your head like a fucking car wreck that no one told you about. So, hey, we're Guns N' Roses, and you're watching uh, MTV in Japan. Don't change that channel. What do they do when they put you in jail? Did you have a cell by yourself, or were there other people? Did you get to talk to any of their, like, inmates or anything? You know, I'm, I basically spent my time writing autographs for cops and talking with them about rock and roll. I met all these really cool cops that were telling me all about when they went to Woodstock and everything. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> New York cops are the best. <laughs> The question in many observers' minds, of course, was why Rose didn't just return to St. Louis to plead his case months ago. According to Rose, it's taken this long to work out an ironclad deal, which, as things stand now, means a sentence of two years probation reduced to one year. We've just been waiting till, like, to get the, the case somewhat solidified and in writing before we go, because I don't want to go there and get set up. You know, well, you come here, it's going to be like this, and then it's, it's a whole different story, and, and you end up sitting in St. Louis for a long time. What does probation mean? You can't do any, come back to St. Louis and do something bad, or you can't do something bad anywhere in the country? It's like anywhere. It's, it's anywhere, but I'm not really worried about any of that because I really don't spend my time breaking the law, so I'm not really worried about that. It just depends on, you know, if you play some place where somebody doesn't like rock and roll or Guns N' Roses, they could say I did something, yeah. you know. You never know what will happen with that. And what exactly happened at that St. Louis concert one year ago? Did Rose provoke a riot, or was he simply reacting to a collapse in concert security? Here's what he told us. We have a tape of one guy on stage with a knife, and uh, we lost a million dollars worth of equipment in that, in that show. And I don't see anybody else taking any responsibility for anything. I'm, I'm saying, yeah, I jumped off stage, and yeah, things went haywire after that. And I, maybe I could have handled it better or whatever, but no one was really handling anything at that point. So I took it into my own hands with what I could do and what crossed my mind that time because I'd been pretty much pushed to the limit by their lack of security. Um, but I don't see anybody else in St. Louis really taking any uh, responsibility for anything that happened. They're from L.A.? Yeah, I think so. Jesus. They have this T-shirt and... Uh, it's like this scary woman in garters. And she's got like some <laughs> rope around a guy's head or something. He's between her legs. And it says, smell the magic. <laughs> oh. Okay, Kurt. Okay, are we going? Have speed. Me. Oh. Yep. Okay. How's it feel to be back on stage? You know? It feels great. It feels great. I mean, we've been, you know, planning, you know, this for... Ever since we started, we've been aiming at, you know, being, we wanted our, our second major album. We wanted a headlining tour, yeah. you know, and to do it right. And it feels great. You know, we, we think we got all the pieces in the right place and we, the morale is really high. Yeah. And actually, now that we're starting the tour, everybody's going to be starting to get in more shape while we're playing yeah. and stuff. Brought a trainer and everything. And just into doing our job, we've set out to do our whole <laughs> lives. Is there is there a fundamental difference in in what's going on in the band now that you have a you know a new drum, completely new drummer and a keyboard player too? I mean, has it changed the music at all, or just the scope of the sound? Um, well, Matt's really solid, you know, and you can everybody in the band can rely on Matt's playing. Yeah. You know, it's you know the drums are are like your anchor, and he's definitely the strongest anchor yeah. we've ever had, and one of the best drummers that there are, I think, in the world, and. You know, because every show I'm more amazed by. I'm actually going to be recording some stuff here to finish it up. In Wisconsin? Recording on the road, yeah. Oh. Finishing up, but we went through uh, mastering of like 25 of the songs um, right before I left. Yeah. And we went through.
went through all the approval of lyrics and all that stuff, and the artwork's all coming together, and yeah, it's definitely coming out. All right, good. Did the, uh, why, did, why did you decide to put it out as two separate records when, of course, it could have been a double gatefold spread single album? Well, um, on album form, on, on, the, on the wax, mm. it's four albums because we wanted to have the deepest grooves and stuff for mm. since vinyl's somewhat going out we wanted to be one of the last bands doing the best job we could for mm. you know audio files and stuff you know the deepest grooves and and a minimal amount of time on each side mm. and figuring out the sequ sequencing was really hard <laughs> trying to you know <laughs> to start each side and end each yeah. side with a cool song so it sounded like it began began and ended right resolved properly and the CDs and the tapes being, you know, two yeah. separate things, we were like going, well, a lot of kids and a lot of people, you know, when they go to buy a record, they go to buy one yeah. and they won't be able to, you know, it's like if there's a choice, well, I'd like to get Guns N' Roses, but it's twenty nine ninety five, right. and this other band's told me, oh, I'll get that one. You know, we're like, maybe we can, you know, <laughs> get past that a little bit. Pass there. You can buy one or the other. How does, it, how does it sound better, on CD or on vinyl? Um, I'm sure it will sound better on CD. Yeah. You know, we work to make it sound stronger on CD, but we're going to, you know, definitely work on the mastering to get the best sound we can on yeah. the vinyl. Everything gets as much attention as anything else. Every single song's got as much attention yeah. as any one song. Um, every little part, you know, we're kind of perfectionists who never quite get it right. But. <laughs> Is there some sort of different concept for each of these records? I mean, is there a different mood for each one? Or Well, I'd say the first half of the first CD is more in line with Appetite, it's mm -hmm. all new songs. And the second half of the first CD has Coma and November Rain mm -hmm. and The Garden, so some really experimental numbers for us. And then I'd say the, the first half of the second one is the South will rise again. <laughs> we didn't plan on that, <laughs> but we. But there's like, there's there's de you know it's like Heaven's Door yeah. and Civil War, and um, song Yesterdays, and a song called Breakdown that definitely have a bit of a Southern rock feel. Wow. That like we've like I'd say Paradise City like in the chorus kind of has that and Sweet yeah. Child kind of has that and it's. There's, it, it ended up the best sequencing to make the record flow all the way through. We didn't yeah. plan on putting all those songs in that vein together, but to make this, the record flow all the way through, so if you wanted to listen to all of it, that's the best way. Hmm. You know? And there'll be uh, a version of Don't Cry on both records, one on the first one and one on the second. Mm -hmm. And the one on the first one is the newly recorded version of the original lyrics. Mm -hmm. And then the second one, is the newly recorded version of alternative lyrics they're kind of like 91 updates got different um words and melody in the verses and it just kind of happened while i was recording the other one we were like i mean and that's the song that you know basically is why we got one of the reasons we got signed yeah. and people in la that have been our fans since we've started playing clubs we're always bummed we never put it on record yeah. but we were kind of trying to save what we considered one of our ace cards because we didn't know if we'd sell five <laughs> records you know or what have the lyrics changed like radically? Are they more upbeat now, or? Um, I I don't know that it's it's more upbeat or anything. It's just kind of where my head's at with that song now. Yeah. You know, rather than making a nostalgia piece, you know, when we do the new one or hear it, and a lot of people that liked the original and it was their favorite song, you know, the yeah. license plates that say "Don't Cry" or whatever. <laughs> um, heard the new one and kind of flip out like how did you do that I don't know <laughs> but you know when we were in the studio I was like I don't know what's happening Mike but just let me go with it you know and it worked out really nice and my friend uh, Shannon Hoon's in a band Blind Melon and he's from Indiana and they were doing Don't Cry back there yeah. they got a bootleg demo tape in, in Lafayette and I didn't even know him I knew his sister but he has a really gorgeous voice, so we do like kind of a duet on the songs. Oh, wow. He sings on four songs. He sings on The Garden and um, sings on You Ain't the First. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's a lot of other vocalists on this, right? I mean, is he singing songs? And... Yeah, I mean, I, I worked on bringing the other people out with what they did, I thought what yeah. they did best. You know, we still haven't worked it out on stage how we do it yet, you know, but. Is there going to be a point where you're going to be able to play like all this material on stage? Could you really perform it all on stage? I, you know, 
you know, a dream I have is to get to where I can do a three-hour show. Yeah. And right now we don't use a set list. We just pick song to song on how it feels and what we think we can perform best and what I think vocally I can do best because it's still warming up. I figure, you know, we're going to go out and give as much as we can every time. But I figure a real Guns N' Roses show, what we're, we're shooting for, hopefully I might have in six months. I mm. mean, remember that thing I, was, I told you last time? It's like Jagger was working on getting that stage thing together for a really long time yeah. you know, and learned a lot from him. You know, so we're hoping that in six months we can actually have different set yeah. orders and things and have it planned out so it's a lot more dramatic. Yeah. You know, and there'll be additions to the stage set up and the lighting and yeah. things like that. We didn't use right now because of my heel, we're not using a lot of the stage setup that we have. We have extra ramps and yeah. ramps coming out in the middle, fully lighted, and we're not using any of that at this particular yeah. time. Dizzy said he's hoping that there'll be some sort of like sign language so that he'll know what the next song yeah. is and the rest of the guys. We're working it out, you know, <laughs> little by little. We're, we're trying. What was the, What exactly happened to your, how did you do this to your foot? Um, I've just had a chronic history of bruising my heel and messing up the ligament, but never couldn't couldn't afford it at the time when it happened when it was like in junior high and yeah. stuff to figure out what was wrong and then about a week ago we played the ritz in new york and i got really excited and was just jumping off everything and, you know there's a lot of photos of me like 10 feet in the air and stuff and came down really hard on my heel when i was jumping up not even on stage off the stage and landed on my heel on a cement floor with no cushioning in my boots mm -hmm. and just messed up the ligament and stuff, but the doctors seemed to think it'll be fine. We had like all the top doctors from the Brewers and the Packers and New Balance shoes all working on designing me something so I could run around. Because yesterday, well, without without this, it's definitely limping. Yeah. But you know, we didn't want to call the show. You know, I was, so no, none of them tried to tell you you should really take six months off and just stay off your foot. And... Well, we we wasted Slash. Um, <laughs> Slash came in yesterday. They put a test cast and they're putting this cast on me. And all the all the plaster going and everything, and we bring Slash in, and, the, and there's three doctors all over me. The guy look, guy looks at Slash. And he's like, "Yeah, it's going to be six weeks <laughs> off, and um, there's a good chance it'll be surgery. It'll be 12 weeks." <laughs> the man stopped breathing. He was, <laughs> and he was just staring. I, I let it go five minutes before I sprung it on him that it was crap, you know, because I thought he was going to fall over. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Slash says he's in good shape now. You know, he's not totally a health fiend, but he's everything's going good. Yeah, and I mean, everybody will get in better shape once we, like, you know, get some, you know, uh, some form of regimentation down, you yeah. know, and, and stuff, and realize what we're in and what we're doing, and we're doing it every day because we want to take this for the long haul and as yeah. long as that can be. It'd be nice if we could, you know, go for a year and a half to two years because wow. there'll be, after this comes out, there'll be an EP of six punk rock yeah. songs coming out, and we'll be work, we're already starting to work on new material now with an eight track on the road, and hopefully, you know, we can fire something out by the end of this, yeah. rather than wait forever. <laughs> I think it's kind of touching that you're putting out this punk rock tribute EP, now that, you know, the band is expanding its sort of horizons and moving on to different kinds of material, but remain true to your roots. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and also because I've watched, like, you know, I got made fun of for liking the Ramones. Yeah. And then, you know, eight years go by, and then everybody that was making fun of me is sitting around watching Rock and Roll High School yeah. and loving it. And, I, you know, I want a lot of these people to hear songs that they didn't hear. I mean, they're, they're, they're selected cuts that you can't really find the original recordings yeah. that they're on and B-sides and stuff of songs we think really rock and way way influenced us yeah. and we also do a tribute to Steve Bader's yeah. we did ain't it fun with Mike Monroe and um, it was really strange because when we did it you know both of us in certain places without even trying ended up sounding a bit like Steve you know candles would flicker and bells would ring for no reason and we were like Steve's here <laughs> God, did the uh, and Johnny Thunders died too? It's been a bad year for those guys. But uh, we, were, we were talking to a lot of the fans out for like hours out front tonight. It's it was telling Slash, it's amazing that given, given the amount of material that's actually come out from Guns N' Roses, not a lot for like a major band. But they, there's really this connection between the fans and the, the group. I mean, it's just incredible. Do you still get to talk to people and get some feedback from them? Can you do that? Can you go out and like just meet them? Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I have to usually somewhat keep uh, it a bit controlled and stuff so things don't get crazy and yeah. stuff. But, you know, I was out signing autographs and talking to other people tonight. Yeah. And, yeah, um, or I'll, like, keep in touch with somebody who does have a really good ear to the street and yeah. stuff, you know, so I can keep up with what's going on out there yeah. and keep aware and keep up to date and stuff, even if I'm busy and have to stay home and work on my record. <laughs> I mean, what do you do? You think this is because of the state of music at the moment? It's like this kind of whatever this stuff is on the charts. I mean, there's, you're like the only guys. Um, yeah, I'm not bagging on anybody else, but um, there's a lot of people that are just worried about being rock stars or individual rock stars in bands, you know. And I mean, there's a lot of with Guns N' Roses fans. There's a lot of Axel, you know. But uh, it's like this is a band, and I wouldn't be able to do what I do the way I do it and wouldn't be able to get the recognition if I didn't have the band yeah. I have being supportive and playing the music that they play that makes me run around yeah. and stuff. You know, we all pretty much get off on each other a lot, you know, so it's definitely a band thing. It's, you know, it's weird because it's like, uh, like the Doors movie wasn't <laughs> really about the Doors, yeah. you know, but I mean, you knew that was going to happen and stuff, but it was... There wouldn't have been, you know, the place for him to do what he did if he didn't have that band. Yeah, right. Precisely. Did the uh, and you've met, you met Arnold Schwarzenegger too? I gather. I mean, Arnold was great. Him. Arnold's really nice. How did this happen? Um, he apparently has a Guns N' Roses head. <laughs> you know, and he was uh, working on his movie, and he said that he was talking with Jim Cameron, the director who did the yeah. this, and, and, and he was. Um, saying he wanted to get some good music, some hard music, some Guns N' Roses. Some really strong stuff. <laughs> For like stuff. a very long time. And finally, wow. like, in the last month, all of a sudden he was like, I think you're right. And I was like, it's a little late. But <laughs> what worked out really cool is we wanted to put out a version of a song, You Could Be Mine. Mm -hmm. And also with Don't Cry, so we have a rocker and a ballad. Yeah. And we let them listen to a lot of the material and the song they picked was You Could Be Mine. Mm -hmm. And so it worked out good for both of us. And um, we shot a, a video for it. We, we filmed the show in the Ritz, and then, you know, I guess Arnold was flying back from concerts. I'm going, I want to be in the video. <laughs> so Arnold got all his people and put together a video. So we'll <laughs> have yet to see what, it, what it's like. Have you seen the movie? Um, I saw the movie. I liked it. It's Terminator meets the Abyss. It's real high tech. Yeah. You know, I don't want to give anything away about it. Does your song crop up in a particularly moving part of the movie? The song um, pops up in a way that the kids will like, oh, yeah, and they'll love it, you know, and that's a lot of fun, because I remember being like that when I was a kid, you know, yeah. just crank my rock and roll, and, you know, and so it works real good that way, and it's it's pretty energetic. Yeah. Was it was Skid Row, the first band that came to your mind, and you said, we need an opening act, who should we get? You said, well, it's got to be them. Um, well, we just figured that uh, we wanted a really high energy, we wanted to give the people something they really wanted yeah. more than other acts at the time and something on a hard rock vein. And we, you know, ever, you know, Skid Row was doing really great and people wanted them. And then Sebastian and I get along great. Yeah. You know, we're hoping to work together some. And... Like record together? It just, yeah, we want, I told you that last time, we want to yeah. do a version of Amazing Grace. All right. We haven't got to it yet. <laughs> but, uh... I just thought it would be a good package because it will only be for a while, yeah. you know, and then they're going to go with a couple other bands and then hopefully go to headlining themselves. And so, you know, it's when you're a kid, you're always going, you know, it would be a great show if I could see this band and this band and this yeah. band. And we just knew that that would be one of the shows that if we, you know, if we didn't do, people would be talking, well, what would that, would, what would that yeah. be like? the two things together. So it's something we felt we had to do, yeah. you know? I mean, I was gonna say like, almost even if we had hated them, but we don't, you know, we were gonna know we, we gotta do this because it'll be a lot of fun, yeah. you know? And the fact that we get along so well and that they're really into what they do and yeah. it's high energy, I mean, they got the crowd all worked up for when we come yeah, out there. Definitely. And it's definitely a, now it's a, a really large audience cross, you know, and they have a lot of people that haven't seen us. There's a lot of Skid Row fans that are more into Skid Row than Guns N' Roses. There's Guns N' Roses fans that are more into us than Skid Row. And it brings us to all of them. You know, and I yeah. really like that.
Do you think the music business understands what, what Guns N' Roses is by this point, or do they just see it as like, well, these are the latest hit makers? I don't know. I think the music business is starting to go well. <laughs> You're not making a whole lot of mistakes, so we'll just go with it. And if it's, if, you know, if it's fun for everybody, it'll be cool, and we're trying to make things nice for everybody that's involved. Yeah. You know, and that's it's really fun for me, you know, because, you know, getting the reputation of such a brat, you know, it's good to turn it around. <laughs> Jesus. I feel like a brat when I'm up there running around. I feel like a little kid. <laughs> do you ever, do you ever, do you, are you conscientiously trying to keep the business from taking over the music? I mean, you know, everybody turn up in suits to have meetings about the future of the band and stuff. And we don't really have that. You know, we really have a lot of control over everything we do. Yeah. And um, we have the full support of Geffen Records and... Um, there's not a whole lot of getting in the way, and if somebody is really getting in the way, we figure out a way to remove them. <laughs> so, uh -huh. yeah. so it's going really nice, and that's the advantage of selling, you know, 12 million records or whatever yeah. we sold off, you know, off um, appetite. You know, it, it's there's a reason for the power, and there's a lot of people that are going, well, if I was Axel, I would do this with the power and the sound. It's like, yeah, but we're just starting yeah. this tour. People have no idea what I yeah. want to do with my position and where I'm at. You know, I'm trying to find the right organizations. I want to get involved with things for child abuse and sexual yeah. abuse for children. And, but I don't know exactly where to place. Yeah. You know. You must get hit financial. on by a lot of people, I would imagine. Yeah, right? you know, you got Bill Cosby sending you things to donate $5,000 to a library or something, you know. But yeah. I, at the same time, going, but Bill would hate my record. Yeah. <laughs> so... <laughs> God. So, there's a, there's, so the next two years are going to be doing this, right? You don't have any side projects. You're not going to be starring in a movie or anything like that. This is strictly the. Band I mean, thing. if there's any, if there's any room in time off, because I mean, you know, I'd like to do a bit part, you know, yeah. something small, you know, and if we have two weeks and the filming's really quick, that'd be really nice if mm -hmm. it's the right, the right thing. Maybe an Arnold movie or something. Yeah, yeah we talked a little. So. <laughs> Yeah. Terminator 3 coming up. Yeah, Arnold's great. <laughs> Arnold's great. It was really wild to find out he was into Guns N' Roses. <laughs> Let's imagine what else he might be into. I mean, more adventurous man than we had guessed. Let's go He's a man who hangs right? with Kennedys. That's really wild. <laughs> You had uh, you, you mentioned at one point last time we talked. Actually, you said you might it'd be really cool to do something with somebody like Public Enemy. Maybe go out with them. I mean, it's still yeah, it really would. not I'm really into LL Cool J. Yeah, and uh, we just. We have no idea who we're going to be playing with on any of the other, you know, legs of the tour. Yeah. We have we have nothing really set up with that. I'd um, like to do some stuff with Lenny Kravitz. Um, I'm really into N.W.A. And we just want to make sure the audience yeah. doesn't hurt each other yeah. with their racial violence towards each other. You know, if we're showing, we're getting along and we're rocking out yeah. two different types of music and styles, but with attitude, we want we don't want the audience thrashing each other, you know, yeah. and that's a big responsibility and something hard to figure out. Yeah. I mean, because we're the band that the Ku Klux Klan is supposed to be showing up at shows to pass out things, and it's like, when a Ku Klux Klan guy is met, it's like, out of here. You know, have you encountered these guys? Have you seen these guys showing up at your shows? I haven't seen them <clears> for a show, so <laughs> I mean, so I don't. Has know. this ever happened? Um, well, they said they were going to, and uh, <laughs> you know, we were going to, you know, sue the Ku Klux Klan because they were trying to say we were supporting racism. It's like, you know, the Grand Wizard and stuff, and it's like, you know, fired off the letters from the lawyers right away. It's like you're out. Don't even think about, you know, you misinterpreted something I said. Yeah. Don't even think about it. Yeah. Did you see the Did you see the uh, unplug show that MTV did with the rap guys backed up by a band? <laughs> you got to see this. I you? haven't got to see any episodes of Unplugged, and I'm hoping I can get tapes from you guys. Well, they got they got because I hear about all these great can. shows. But they had LL Cool J on there, and they yeah. had this band, like an acoustic band, backing them up and doing all the like scratch things, like scraping on the guitar string. They're brilliant. It's unbelievable. That sounds, I think we can that arrange sounds a dub of some That sounds sort. amazing. <laughs> I'm I'm really into the song. I'm the type of guy. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> That's really awesome. My mama said, knock you out. It's a really, really amazing song. I think I got an LL Cool J poster somewhere here on the tour. <laughs> Did the uh, Spin Magazine just write a copy of the contract that you guys were putting out at one time, which people might be thinking, oh, what is it with these guys? Are they trying to control everything? I mean, do you, 
think you're misrepresented when stuff like that comes up in the press? Well, in regards to Spin Magazine, you know, I read a review of that piece yeah. somewhere else, and it was like, kudos to Spin Magazine for not bowing and scraping for an interview, when the facts are that that's basically what they've been doing for a really long time, and since they couldn't get it, they decided to be hostile. And um, that was a test contract, basically, because of... Um, certain situations we've had with the English press that we tested in Rio. Yeah. And the most outrage that we really got was from the magazines that we were having problems with to begin yeah. with, you know, because we weren't going to talk to them anyway, and then they saw that and went running with it. But, um, no, we're not trying to control everything. We just want what we said, or anything we say, to be in the proper context yeah. and to be something we really said, you know? And we've had certain things that make, may not hit the world on a big scale, yeah. um, but dealing with smaller magazines and stuff where they've ran all kinds of interviews we never did. Yeah. And where they've said I said things, like I may have said something hostile to a member of another band, mm -hmm. but they've turned around and said I said all kinds of things I didn't say. And it's like the things I said were even meaner, but I knew what limb I was going out on, and then somebody cuts down the tree underneath yeah. me. And it's like, it's not really fair, because I do take the time to try to answer the questions and, and talk about things as honestly as I can, and yeah. then have someone distort that, you know, and if a magazine, you know, has a, maybe they have a subscription rate of 50,000, 72,000, but, you know, this was a 40,000 people's show yeah. tonight. 40,000 people were here, you know, and that hits that many people with a different impression of us, you yeah. know, and that, that kind of hurts. Yeah. So we're just trying to make sure that doesn't happen. You know, um, if we don't have a real big problem and if we get along with people, we don't even, you know, ask about the contracts. You yeah. know, it's like, if we know it's okay, everything's going to be okay yeah. and it's going to be honest, then it's fine. You know, uh, we, uh, the contracts are kind of, I laugh, you know, when they make such a big deal because it's kind of, kind of like a deterrent for people that want to cause problems. They see that and you know, yeah. they won't be able to get in to cause their problems. Well, it's a turn, well, I mean, it's also a deterrent for like the New York Times too. I mean, if you're, you know, doing yeah, um, that. You know, I guess there was a guy there that wasn't really into us, but he wrote a really nice review and yeah. we did uh, the show in New York and that was kind of a surprise and it was yeah. really nice. And I think when people get to know a bit more about us, they might find a few more things they like. They'll probably find yeah. a lot more things they dislike. But, you know, I think with all the hype, and all the people and everybody waiting for so long, you know, to see what's this band about and everybody talking. A lot of it's just been, you know, just snowballed. Someone yeah. said this, someone said that, and and they just keep hearing all these stories, and now they can, you know, see reality. Yeah. As your as your voice holding up, now you're back on the road doing all this stuff. Do you have to like um, get, get into training? And seems to be doing good, and I'm and. Uh, you know, I'm finally, for the first time, into doing my warm downs after a show, and I'm bringing my voice teacher up so he can see some shows and see what it is I do, because this man works opera, and he has no idea what it is I do exactly. He'll be shocked, right? <laughs> yeah. I had him at one show in L.A., so he's getting the idea, you know, and then, you know, and I'm taking the steps so that I can ensure the people a good show and that I'm up to my, my best. Yeah. Do the uh, so you're going on the road for like a year and a half, two years? Is everybody in the band just putting their personal lives on hold, and then like we're just going to live out of suitcases? And well, we've kind of most of us have figured out how to integrate our personal lives into what we do. Mm -hmm. Where we tried it before and it wasn't really working, or the you know we weren't with the right people, and so now now things are kind of going together, and this is our personal life. Yeah, you know sure. we've we've wanted to live on the road, you know, and enjoy it. And everything is, is so nice and on such a big scale, it's really nice, you know. Yeah. hate to go down the tubes and be back to a van going to the clubs, but... I don't think you're in danger can... of having that happen anytime real soon. <laughs> yeah. Never know. <laughs> Never know. I don't want to take it for granted. Well, I'm sure you've got some money socked away in the bank, right? But that's, keep that savings account going. Um, the more money you make, the bigger the sharks you meet. Yeah, no. That's good for me. Is that good for you, David? Yeah, pretty good. Thank you very much. No problem. Maybe only in attitude in some of them. I mean, Ross done all kinds of material. Um, I like Kiss in their early days. I, you know, I think the only thing that we have in common with Kiss now is that, you know, they like to make money and they like girls, but as far as their music go, 
you know, basically their music is like second fiddle to their other desires. Our music comes first. Have you got anything in common with Iron Maiden? I hope not. Why? I don't know. They're not. I mean, they're nice guys, but you know, it's like political organizations. You know, your band's like a political thing, um, and your your music or your album's kind of like your political stance. Well. Theirs is completely different ours than, than ours, and I think theirs doesn't have anything to do with rock and roll as far as I'm concerned. We're a rock and roll band. Yeah, if you um, listen to the what they do is what they do. I don't know what it is, and I hope to never be like that. Hope it's not catchy. Izzy, were you going to say something then? You had mentioned there, you had some goals for this record. I mean, you guys are in a position where you're like, you're the hard rock band in the country, if probably not the world. Where, where do you go next? I mean, what are you trying to um, demonstrate? There's lots of kinds of material. Um, basically, with all kinds of different reactions in the press and this and that, it was kind of like the only way to show where we've been and, and to make ourselves happy was to just try to put it all out, try to put all the material out at once, which, you know, 148 minutes, that hasn't really been done. I mean, Springsteen put out a five album box set, but it was live. You know, it had been done over the years. Most of this is, is new material, and there's a couple cover tunes in it. Is this album going to be also mixed up like GNR Lies? There's going to be a lot of acoustic stuff on it, too. There's going to be different stylistic things going on. Yeah, there'll be, um, there'll be a few acoustic things. Um, there'll be some songs that are acoustic going into electric, back to acoustic, and stuff like that. I actually play guitar on a couple songs for really? the first time. <laughs> I can only play two strings, but it's some pretty cool punk rock type stuff. <laughs> Well, how come uh, how come Stephen left the band at this critical juncture? Stephen didn't leave the band. Or how come you and Stephen was fired? Part of, oh, okay. Stephen, um, we gave him every ultimatum. We tried working with other drummers. We had Stephen sign a contract saying if he went back to drugs, then he was out. Yeah. Um, he couldn't leave his drugs, and um, other things have happened involved with Stephen that Stephen is basically someone I used to know. It makes me feel bad, yeah. but um, there's other things beside the band that he was involved in with his drugs that have been very dangerous and scary, and that I want nothing to do with him. Is, he, is that what you were talking about when you were open for the Rolling Stones in L.A. last year? You said somebody in this band has been dancing with Mr. Brownstone, essentially. Oh, there was... Um, majority of the band was at that time or too much alcohol or too much yeah. something I me mean, i was eating too much or whatever and just sitting on my ass too much yeah how's um, it going how's it going with the new drummer is he fitting right in or it must be very hard at this point to bring somebody new into the band isn't it, it? was a miracle yeah. he has saved the band's life <laughs> he came in he's in an up mood he works he writes his own material yeah. he writes a lot he works real well with us um he takes suggestions well, he keeps everybody in line, keeps the timing great. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, he, he played 29 songs in a month. You, you mentioned you're doing, one of the covers you're doing is You Only Live Twice. Why that of all the songs in the world? You only, no, no, Live and Let Die. Oh, I'm sorry, Live and Let Die. That's right. Live and Let Die. <clears throat> um, it, uh, I don't know, I was watching the, uh, I thought about it once a long time ago, but just thought you never be able, able to get that the way it sounds. Yeah. It's that done that well. And then I was watching, uh, I'd rented the movie and I was watching it and I just <laughs> went, this, this song sounds like Welcome to the Jungle too." <laughs> <laughs> you know? It's like now that you're here. So, and it, ju it just felt right. So we ended up playing it a little bit in rehearsal and it started working. And now that we actually have gone and started recording it, you know, we're finding out that, wait, we are good enough to play this song. Yeah. You know, we didn't think we were. You know, we didn't think we were good enough to get it down right. You know, but Slash is doing most of the string arrangements yeah. on his guitar with a harmonizer. And it's, so it's kind of like, to me, it's like Tom Waits meets Metallica or something. Because <laughs> the way I sing, it's so rough and scratchy. But, you know, that I sound like Tom Waits or something on it, kind of. Yeah. It's working out really good, and it, it sounds like us. Yeah. So, I mean, everybody that hears it goes, thinks that it sounds like the perfect song for us to do. Have you got anything coming up? You had mentioned there's something on the, a song on this album that's coming up that might cause some problems. You think? Is there anything? There's you can a say? song called Coma that 
is like 11 minutes and 45 seconds long with no chorus. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I think there was only one verse that like re somewhat repeats itself. Um, it's Slash's baby. It's his monster. The song used to be called Girth. <laughs> um, but I started writing about when I OD'd four years ago. Mm. And the reason I OD'd was because of stress. I couldn't take it. Yeah. And I just grabbed this bottle of pills in, 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 a, in an argument and just gulped them down. No. And I ended up in the hospital. And, but I liked that I wasn't in the fight anymore. And I was fully conscious that I was leaving. Yeah. I liked that. But then I, I go, all of a sudden my, my first real thoughts though were that, okay, you haven't toured enough, the record's not gonna last, it's gonna be forgotten, and this and that, you have work to do, get out of this. And I went, no, and I woke up, you know, wow. and pulled myself out of it. Mm -hmm. Um, but in the describing of that, some people could take it wrong and think this means go put yourself into a coma, yeah. you know, and so it's, it's really tricky and I'm still playing with the words to figure out how to like show some hope in there. Yeah. Well, you seem to have, I mean, from a couple of years ago, like ODing on pills, you've come a long way since then. Do you feel more settled down now and you seem pretty relaxed and together? Yeah, but it's been a lot of work to do that because there's, you know, part of, we got used to like, as the Eagles would say, everything all the time, as and the you know, living that way and going for it, and all of a sudden you started to really, and then that's what got us here. That's what got us signed. That's what got us on top of things. And then you started, then you got to a point where you go, wait a minute, everything that got me here is also starting to self, yeah. starting, I'm starting to self-destruct. It's starting to tear up my life. I have to figure out how to channel my energies other directions. It's, it's a weird one. Settling down is a weird <laughs> one, you know. Do you think it's just a function of like getting older and uh, um, you know, learning more and being more aware of what's going on? It's realizing there's life after you know 21, life yeah. after 25, life after 27. You yeah. know, 27 was the hardest year. Um, I met Prince and I was talking with Prince and he was like, "How old are you? 28?" And he goes, "Last year was the hardest, wasn't it?" And he was saying how 27 is like the bitch. It's the hardest year. Really? <laughs> um, 27 was definitely my hardest year. <laughs> Well, it's all behind you now. Yeah, it's still a mess, but like I'm used to when it gets a mess. Yeah. Do, do you uh, consider that valid when people say, well, you're up there in front of kids, uh, you have to set a good, a good example? I mean, a lot of people say, well, no, I'm an artist. I don't have to set an example. I just do my art. I mean, how do you feel about that? It's real tricky. Um, when we, our first major tour was with Motley Crue, and the audience was younger than most. Yeah audiences we played like on the Aerosmith tour or in other tours or our own tours and the tours with the cult and it was real hard to do the song it's so easy yeah. because there's a line in there I drink and drive and everything's in sight um, we were talking about kind of how we got away with things and we're lucky to be here um, it was real hard knowing that some of these kids would just go out and go yeah I drink and drive everything's in sight I mean Izzy put it best when he said a lot of people think our record means you know, party and do cocaine and rock and roll, and it's like, and that just ain't what it is. Yeah. And so Izzy was going to quit at one time because he was, didn't like the way people were reacting to it. I was, heard something on the radio last night when Frank Zappa broke up the mothers, it was because people were clapping for all the wrong reasons. Yeah. It's hard when you know that you're doing your material and the audience, a majority of your audience, isn't getting what you meant. What's the, what's the first music you remember hearing when you were a kid? Is there one thing that turned you on and said, wow, this is what I want to do? Um, when that happened, when it turned, I mean, I was already playing and singing in church music and all kinds of things. When it happened that, is this what I want to do, was Led Zeppelin's Jamaica. Mm -hmm. When I heard that, I was making fun of it all day long. Because I was always writing down the lyrics to all the joke songs that were out, spiders and snakes and stuff, and passing it <laughs> out to all the kids. But I heard that song and I was going, yeah, there's another one. Oh, 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 oh. and I was about making fun of it. But by the afternoon recess, I was in the corner with the radio waiting to hear that song. <laughs> that, Benny and the Jets, just made me go, I want this. It's yeah. funny, you wouldn't, it's, I wouldn't normally picture you as an Elton, Elton John, like, launching your consciousness of music. Elton John is it. If, if like, you know, his, especially the first seven albums, Bernie Taupin, yeah. to me, is the best lyric writer that's ever lived on the face of the <laughs> earth. And, and Elton John was just amazing in the studio and yeah. the recording of everything and it's some of it's so art i mean to me that's my classical music because some of his stuff is classical yeah right. you know the, and so i listen to elton john all the time yeah. got some dungeon arrangements and everything. i'm always supposed to meet them i think they're the only two people i'm like nervous to meet <laughs> you know it's like something always comes up where i don't feel well and i just can't meet them yeah 
How did you, what were you doing when you, was, was the first thing you did in music, was it church stuff? I mean, you'd just be going to church and singing, were you singing in a choir or something? Or? Um, church stuff, singing since I was a little kid, like my brother and sister and I would have to sing in a trio, which was then the Bailey Trio. And we would sing in front of the church, which started like in the little back room of a library and then built up to where it was a big brick country church. Um, so this is like nearer my God to the stuff like that? Or? Yeah, all the and Amazing Grace and yeah. everything. Actually, Sebastian Bach and I are talking about doing a version of Amazing Grace together. Really? I think it's, it's a whole new idea that him <laughs> and I are going to do this together because everybody wanted us to be enemies yeah. kind of a bit in the you know, press things or who's better or this and that. And it's kind of like we just hit it off. You know? <laughs> Have you, you patched up your, your differences with uh, Vince Neil and the boys? And he had a scuffle last year backstage at the... Oh, uh, no way. You, no? Oh, okay. no way. I haven't patched up anything. The Video Music Awards were not a picnic for all concerned, however, including Guns N' Roses guitarist Izzy Stradlin, who was punched in the face by Motley Crue vocalist Vince Neil, as Stradlin walked off stage with his manager Alan Nivens. This was apparently Neil's reaction to a 1988 incident at an L.A. rock club in which Stradlin allegedly assaulted Neil's wife, Sharice, then had her ejected from a room at the club. Now what's the, the, what's the dispute there? Um, the well, I mean, they think... I've, I've read in the interviews of theirs that they feel that it's like I'm just, you know, standing up for Izzy and stuff, but Vince should be careful what golf courses he's mouthing off about Axel on and who he's playing golf with, you know? When he goes out playing golf and mouths off about Axel and he happens to be playing golf with people that work for me, yeah. the stories come back. Um, you know, and, you know, he, he likes to put in magazines that he broke Izzy's nose or, you know, and how Alan Niven wasn't even there, my manager or anything like that, and no one was around. I don't know. We didn't want to take it to court because it would be too much trouble and too much hassle. But when, you know, Tom Petty's security crew wants to be witnesses in court, <laughs> you know, it's, you know, it's funny because Izzy's like going, because people think it's going to happen sooner or later or, or whatever. And it's like that, that Vince and I will get into it or something, you know, and, and Izzy just, Izzy laughs because he's like, that guy, you know, had a full-on free shot, yeah. you know, and hit like a powder puff, you know, and he was like, so it's like, it's, it's pretty scary if the guy thinks about a real hassle, you know, I put in a magazine, you know, anytime he wants it anywhere, yeah. Atlantic City, I don't care, we'll put money on it, you know, I don't care, you know, and then he tried to turn it around and say the same thing, but, you know, the invitation's yeah. there, I'm easy to find, if you really want a hassle, you know, we can, we can have it out. I always thought everybody on the L.A. scene was so tight and friendly and everything, you know, just, uh... Oh, no, it gets real, real competitive. Um, we tried to help a lot of bands when we, when we knew we were taking off. Yeah. And even some of the bands that we were helping, I don't want to name names or anything, ended up getting very jealous mm -hmm. because they were having to, like, kind of, like, exist in our shadow a bit. And that was really hard because we were, like, we could have given the gigs to somebody else. Yeah. You know, we could have helped someone else out. Jeez. Do you, are you still, did you still feel a part of the scene? I mean, you still go out, right? Can you still go to clubs a, and a, stuff? A little bit, yeah. I can go out more now. People don't, it's, it's not as crazy as it was. Yeah. It's the ball starting to get rolling again and it's starting to get crazy again. But I can go out a little bit. Um, about a year ago, it was a mess. Now, now it's mowing out and I think people are a little bit, I don't know if it's intimidated or, or what, they're just, they, now they kind of look at me like, oh my God, no, that can't be him. Even if they're talking to me, they don't think that they would see me, which is kind of cool. Because <laughs> you don't see as a, as, as a, each other as much as you did when you were like, living in one Yeah, one place, everybody right? has their own lives. I mean, <clears throat> Izzy basically has five Harleys, and, and every time you're looking for Izzy, you find out he's in Mexico, or he's <laughs> in London, or he drove to Texas, or yeah. he's up in Yellowstone or something, uh -huh. you know? He's always somewhere. What about the rest of the guys? Are they pretty scattered too? I mean, Slash, um, they home and play all the time. And... He's always working on something, yeah. working on his house or working on someone else's record yeah. or something like that. So we don't really hang that much, but we call each other up on the phone to tell each other what we did. You know, we're yeah. best friends even though we have separate lives somewhat, yeah. you know. And we brought that friendship back together, you know, because otherwise it was getting to a point where, okay, then we are going to go separate. Can you, can you imagine yourself ever going off and doing like a solo album? Can you imagine finding a band that would be for you at Guns N' Roses is? No, I can imagine finding people that play really good that I want to do songs with mm -hmm. and see about possibly putting a solo project together at some point, but not getting the same effect. Yeah. 
but I can't really see trying to duplicate what Guns N' Roses is because Guns N' Roses is so much more than we ever thought it really would be. It's Which is odd. You wouldn't expect to hear this in rap circles. I listen to but... Public Enemy now all the time. That's, <laughs> really? Yeah. I listen to Public Enemy, Ice-T, um, N.W.A., and Ghetto Boys. <laughs> are you, do you think that you're, there's a future for you in rap? I mean, are you, are you good at this? I'm not that good at rap. And, you know, um, I listen to it a lot. It's like, I like it because it keeps me awake and aware of what's going on. Yeah. You know, it's like I watch UNTV raps more than I watch Headbangers Ball. Yeah. Headbangers Ball has a lot. Some stuff, some stuff's good. Some things are like, I don't know. It's. It, I look at it like, yeah, I was there five years ago yeah. or six years ago. I want to move on. I listen to Public Enemy a bit more because they, because of all the social issues they bring up yeah. in in their things and in in their songs and stuff. So that's like. I don't know what I agree with and what I disagree with at this point. I'm just listening to it and yeah. enjoying it and enjoying that someone's taking that strong stand on what they believe. All right, what, what do you do? Well, let's, let's take two live crew as an example. I mean, this has been a, a good and a bad year for them. What do, you, what do you make of the fact that someone in the United States for the first time, a record can be declared illegal, essentially? I, mean, this is... I think it's crazy. I mean, I think it's like, you know, saying the diary of Anne Frank, you know, causes influences people in a bad way or something or the dictionary that has if it has a definition for a four-letter word yeah. is in a bad way I mean there was an article in penthouse magazine saying that if you want to like point fingers and say what influences people in a bad way and most powerful influence and like what damage has been done it's like the Bible has caused more wars and death than anything by people True. reacting to it however they feel they should react to this yeah more than any other book, you know? So unless you're gonna get rid of Shakespeare, unless you're gonna get rid of the Bible and things like that, back off and, you know, I'm sorry if it makes your job of raising your kids a little bit harder, maybe, you know, you should have thought about that beforehand before yeah, you had your kids, so. I mean, do you think you'd feel different about this after you had a kid? No, no, not even, even if something, even if my, even if I had a kid and he did something because he thought, because the record said do it, yeah. you know, I. No, I don't think I would feel different at all, because yeah. I think about that a lot. Was, was your experience with religion as a kid essentially positive? I mean, you had the musical aspect of it, that was good. Or it, was, it, was essentially, it was essentially positive about teaching you the King James Bible, yeah. what, is, what the Bible says, but I just watched my church, or watched everybody become very hypocritical and self-righteous to the point that they started like destroying the unity they had that built the church. Yeah. You know, because I was there from the beginning to when it became big church, is a Baptist church? Or? No, it was Pentecostal. Yeah. And it was like about eight miles out in the country. And then it just got very hypocritical and self-righteous, you know, like, you know, you could, you could sit there as a kid and watch people on this side of the church were saying something bad about the people over here, you know, and it's yeah. like, it just got like, who was more religious, you know, within yeah. the church? Who was pure? Who was going to heaven and who wasn't in the congregation? And it was like, it was just very, very negative. Yeah. At does, that it, point. Does, it, does this upset you at all? Seeing because these seem to be the people, the fundamentalist people, <clears throat> seem to be, to be the, the people that are attacking popular music, especially rock and rap now. I mean, people like we just covered a, a record burning, believe it or not. Again, these guys, the Peters brothers, and they're throwing in old the old Ozzy records and all this stuff. I and mean, it's it's incredible that this is coming back again. Here yeah, it's 1990. It's like know? Dave Mustaine says, though, you know, to burn them, you had to go buy them. Yeah. <laughs> Good thought, I suppose. <laughs> you know, it's like go ahead, burn the record. You know, make make some news, <laughs> make some news for me. Um, I think people are just scared of art, you know. Which art's very powerful, and it's hard to say which art, you know, should be in the hands of babes. You know that they don't understand yeah. what they've got in their hands. I mean. The wall is a very powerful yeah. piece of work that like, I know people that like got into the wall and didn't come out of it for yeah. five years, you know? They just locked themselves into this frame of mind of whatever they were getting out of that album. Yeah. You know, and I don't, I, most of it seemed to be positive, but during the five years they became very distant from everybody and very yeah. alienated. Um, but Roger Waters was giving everything he had, describing where he had been in his mind. Yeah, and what life did to him. So I, I don't know. It's it, art. Art's a very powerful thing, and I just don't think they know what to do with it. And I don't think they can stop it. But you have to go out and fight. 
you've always had to do it. And just because we're in the 90s and it seems like it's easier, you know, it's really no different than like you know, back in the 17th century, you know, when you had yeah. to fight for a book to be printed or something. Yeah. Do you still, do you still paint or anything yourself? And I'm just starting to draw and paint. Um, a few years ago, it was like, okay, you can go take photos or you could build this sculpture. Um, you should probably just throw yourself into the band. It was like all or nothing for Guns yeah. N' Roses to get to make this happen, to give me the chance to do whatever I wanted. Yeah. You know, it's like there was other reasons for, you know, Guns N' Roses fighting to get this successful was so that we could do what we wanted and yeah. get a, and get away with it and be able to live comfortably doing it, you know, and have some security. What did you when you finally got you finally got on the stage with the Stones last fall? Were, were they what you expected them to be, you know, 27 years on in their career? Did they still have something going for them, did you think? It was, it was great playing with them. It was, it was a, a definite dream. I mean, it was yeah. something that we told people we were going to do, and people were going, no, they're broke up. I don't care. We're <laughs> going to open for a stone if you wait. <laughs> we're going to do this. I don't know how, but we're going to do this. So, and then, you know, I told Keith Richards that, and he's like, well, you made it, mate. Let me have a cigarette. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they go to Anthrax shows. They go to Metallica shows, you know, but... You know, some of those kids like all kinds of music, but there isn't, you know, they'll go to the Iggy Pop shows when they come to town and stuff like that, you know, and then they came to us, some of them, you know, they, they come to us. It's not totally dead, it's just, but there's not that many of them in bands that are doing that well anymore over there. Um, you know, and it's like, a lot of those people were also into Hanoi Rocks, and now Hanoi Rocks isn't around. And so, we kind of like, fill a gap somewhere, you know, in between Metallica and Hanoi Rocks and Aerosmith, who haven't been there in 10 years, we kind of like come up through the middle, you know, because we put everything kind of like together into one band. And yeah, there was all kinds of different people. I mean, you'd, you'd look at the crowd and see someone who's like 65 years old and then see someone else who's who's 15 with a mohawk. It was great. And the press was really weird because the press, you know, said the crowd hated us, but the crowd was screaming and singing, you know. The press was just trying to see if they could stop us before we got bigger but then we went back into the Odeon for 3,000 people or more so kind of ruined the press as a little a uh, little blockade you know that's that's like saying what's your favorite record it kind of depends on the mood you're in I mean you can pick one but it might not be the one you want to listen to tonight um, one of the best shows I ever saw was an, was an Aerosmith show but it wasn't Aerosmith that was the most exciting part. Rose Tattoo opened the show. And Rose Tattoo was great. I saw him in Indianapolis on December 7th, a few, a few years back, and the Scarred for Life tour. And they opened and they were just phenomenal. Um, Aerosmith was, um, was the Rock and Hard Place tour with Jimmy Crespo and Rick Dufay. And Crespo did one of the best leads I'd ever seen because he, he played off the crowd real well. But it was Rose Tattoo that just blew me away on how, like, because it was, it was an arena like this, packed, about 18,000 people who hated Rose Tattoo. They were, they were Indiana people who just were like, this band sucks, I don't want to see them. But that band, you know, no one had even heard their music. I had heard their music just a couple weeks before I was excited. I just, so I watched people. People went psycho. They were like, this is the greatest. They loved it. Next day, though, they were all scared to say it because it was a lot of kids. And it was, you know, during the big preppy movement in all the schools in the States, you know, eyes odd shirts and the whole bit. So the kids were like saying how much, how much better Pat Travers was because that was the middle act. When Pat Travers played, they turned the lights on so he could go get hot dogs and, co and coke and people were going to sleep. It was, that's how boring it was. Rose Tattoo won the whole audience over, and it's just like I'm going, if they can do it, you know, it's just, you just gotta do it right, you know, and it taught me a lot of lessons. That are blues-based hard rock bands. I mean, you got a couple from Australia, what you have, ACDC, Rose Tattoo, Angel City, and, that, and that's about it that I know of. I think tonight was a blast. Tonight was a really fun show. It's like. I haven't felt too good physically. I've been having throat problems, tonsillitis and stuff on this tour. And tonight was kind of like the first time everything was back in gear and just the kids were great. Mm -hmm. Lots of fun tonight. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that, I love that you think that. Yeah. That's great. Because that's basically what we consider ourselves 
is an 80s version of those type of bands that we heard. You know, there was, there's a lot of different forms of music that we like, but you know, a lot of so many different kinds of things we listen to. But there's certain certain records and certain albums that we listen to consistently, and a lot of those are ACDC, Aerosmith, Led Zeppelin, and old Alice Cooper, and things like that, and Scorpions that we listen to all the time, and it just. It was really surprising to me that in the 80s, there's only, there's the only bands that are playing that style of music are those bands. That none of the kids, you know, that have grown up and have bands of their own now know really how to dig that deep for feeling. But basically, I think it's a, a real emotional thing. Even if you're singing about something violent or singing, whatever you're singing about, I think you have to look real deep for the emotions, and that brings out the, the realness in the material. A lot of material is just, lately it seems to be how fast we can play or how we can do this. A lot of bands do something real fake so that they can be rich and be rock stars. That's, that's, that comes after the fact, that's second. Maybe in rock and roll, but you know, there's, as far as hard rock goes, he is one of the few, but there's a lot of different, what's the word, genre? Um, genres of music where a lot of you know that's that's just part of it i can't help it <laughs> i either stand there bored or i run back and forth and and i kind of get into dancing i don't even know that i like what i do i just i look down at my feet and go what am i doing now but i feel if i stand there then the people think oh this is boring so i got to do something and i just try to do whatever happens um it's a lot of fun i had thought about taking dance lessons and stuff but then i would be, and then i was worried about it getting too stale being too much like organized and everything. I like the spontaneity of just whatever happens. Keeps it real raw and fresh. You know, I don't, if it got too balleted out, I couldn't handle that. Well, it's definitely like now it's reality, not fantasy. Um, I don't know, I think I've always been one to tend to like imagine that it's gonna be better when I get there than it really is, you know, because you just realize it's just another place and but things are going well and we're you know it'll, it'll get bigger um i don't think i'll relax until like we're headlining in a very very big way and being able to put a full show across um and until then it just we're still hungry and then even when we get that then it's like we want to make a really big show we still got a lot of things that we want to do musically um but in I mean, as far as like drugs, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, that kind of stuff, it's all there. It's, it's fun. You just got to try and keep yourself alive while you're doing it. I like X Rose not only for his accomplishments as a musician and his nice voice, but he's also a very interesting person. And if you look into his childhood, which was quite difficult, quite religious household, being beaten and molested as a little kid, He's also known to be a recluse who doesn't enjoy the limelight at all and keeps his private life private. And I believe he's a sensitive and artistic soul who probably took his drugs because he was stressed and overwhelmed, as he even admits in the interview before. Also, it seems he's always been kind of a rebel who says what he thinks, and I like this about him. And he has some quite interesting rants during concerts too, which maybe aren't that relaxing, but quite interesting, so I added a few of such moments that stuck with me. Yo, Axel, cool metal, dude, rock and roll party, do cocaine, yeah. I ain't here for that. Anyway. There was a friend of mine who was telling me how, how some of the members of my family and some of the friends of my family have taken a great offense at what I said in this magazine. It's a shame, what, look what he's done to his mother. His mother can't even go out of the house now. It was amazing my mother could have gone out of the house before knowing the shit she fucking knew. And why is he talking about this? Because it might not have happened to you, but it might have happened to the two or three people that are standing around you who got some fucked up family life that's gonna come back to haunt them when they hit about the age of 25. 
And then you gotta find your way trying to climb your way out of what you thought was your life, but it looks more in your head like a fucking car wreck that no one told you about. Because the family doesn't want to be embarrassed by these things coming out. We just don't want to have to deal with this, and we shouldn't have to deal with this publicly. But if we don't deal with it publicly, then we're probably not gonna deal with the bullshit at all. And I'll bet they like it that way. I'm not a qualified therapist. I don't know a lot of shit about this, but I do know that we're in the 90s. And I do know that if we're gonna make it for another 50 years on this planet, we gotta fucking change our shit now. And there's a lot of motherfuckers that don't want that shit to be changed because that's gonna dig up their crap. There's a lot of parents who done fucked up their kids through their whole fucking lives and they're about, they're about 40, they're about 50 and they think it's cool. Fuck that shit. And I'm the last motherfucking person they thought would be climbing up their ass to tell them about it. But see, for me now, it ain't about fucking doing cocaine. It ain't about how much vodka I drink and how much I can drink someone else under the table. It ain't about what a fucking macho man rock and roller I can be. That shit don't work no more. That's great for little kid rock and roll fucking bullshit, but it don't work no more in the real world for my eyes. I can't come up here and go, yeah, I'm bad, I'm rock and roll, we're doing this rock and roll thing. If my life is falling apart, I can't fake it no more. And just because my family or my record company or somebody else tells me I should so everybody can be happy and make money and rock, yeah, suck my dick. Anyway, there are those in my family who are, they, they plan now that, now that I've written these things, that they're gonna get revenge because it was a terrible thing I did and we're gonna get revenge. Yeah, try it. And if a fucking scrawny little high, junior high 90 pound weakling can finally get his ass up here and take this shit on, so can any one of you that have the same fucking bullshit problems in your life. They don't have to get away with it. I tried being nice. I tried being cool about it. I tried like being friends and offering forgiveness and love and all that kind of shit. All I got was, you know how much we love you, but let's keep the screws on and keep you down like we always have. Yeah, well, guess what? I changed my point of view. For me now, it's kind of like, live and let die, motherfucker. Do you ever wonder why you're giving so much shit to Reed? Oh, they don't want the people like you that are here tonight to see some little loudmouth fucker like me who crawled out of some shithole somewhere and worked his way up onto this stage. They don't want, there's something out there that doesn't want people like you to realize that you can do whatever the fuck you want with your goddamn life. And unless there are those that unless they got a piece of the pie, unless they got a piece of your ass, unless they got a piece of your life, they just don't want it to happen. You do it their way or you don't do it. 
and they can suck my dick. I believe that deep inside everybody, there's something inside you that knows what the fuck it is you're supposed to do with your life. And no matter what anybody tells you, if you keep looking and you keep digging, you're gonna find it. And you can be the person you're fucking meant to be on this goddamn planet. And don't let anybody, anybody ever get in your way.